Hey everybody, this is Gregory from DAP University, and today I have another guest on the channel. I've got Omri here from Bancor Network to talk about uh, a recent incident with Bancor that's kind of been uh, spreading around the blockchain space and the crypto space. Uh, so I invited Omri on the channel today to kind of give Bancor's perspective on uh, what's happened and, and kind of give him some uh, platform to talk about their perspective on the issue. So uh, welcome to the channel. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Yeah, awesome. So maybe before we um, kind of uh, jump into the questions that I hear a lot of people asking about this particular incident, um, maybe you want to kind of just, and I read a lot of articles that say, this is what happened, this is what happened, this is what happened. So instead of hearing, you know, maybe me just regurgitating what all the articles are saying, um, can I just hear it straight from the horse's mouth? Maybe what your perspective on the incident is? Yeah, sure. Happy to. So, um, the uh, first of all, the details of the, of the breach itself are still under investigation, right? I mean, we had we had a, a security breach. Um, a user got access, or a user, uh, a, a criminal, a thief got access to a uh, one of Bancor's wallets, and that wallet was then used uh, to access funds that were stored in a smart contract or in several smart contracts, and. Um, uh, the, the, the details are obviously I, I can't really get in too much detail. Uh, we're we're still trying to catch these guys. We're in the middle of an investigation, and, um, so I, I don't want to get too much in there. But basically, somebody got into the smart contracts, ended up uh, taking off with about twenty three and a half million dollars worth of tokens, uh, ten million dollars worth of BNT, and about uh, mostly uh, with the rest of the tokens. And right after it happened, we were actually able to freeze ten million dollars with the BNT that he ran off with. And uh, and and that that kind of sparked this uh, debate that you're seeing online today, which is the should Bancor have the authority to freeze its own tokens or not? And, uh, sure, 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 sure. Yeah, very cool. So that that sounds uh, pretty similar to the types of things that are, you know, spreading around online. Um, so, you know, you mentioned kind of uh, some of the details of the investigation are, um, you know, are, are ongoing. ongoing, sure. And, you know, there's certain sensitive information that doesn't want to be revealed this time. Um, do, but do you all have any insight on how the attacker gained access to the wallet? Yeah, we do. Um, we do have insight. We're, we're, we're getting more and more details of how it happened every day. Uh, but but again, I, I I'm not at liberty to share them uh, until we until we conclude this thing. And uh, and you know our hope is to to really find this guy and uh, and retrieve these funds and make sure that uh, the blockchain community is safer as a result. So we're sure. hoping that that happens. And as a result, I want to just be a little bit more careful with what we put out. Sure. So you know you mentioned. Um, one of the issues sort of at the uh, crux of this debate or the, th the types of issue that people are raising with this is Bancor's ability to, you know, freeze funds uh, from distribution. Um, I think I read somewhere that, you know, you all were only freezing funds that this person stole and not just any funds, right? And um, that, you know, this was to mitigate the the disaster that this hacker uh, or attacker uh, wreaked on the on the platform. So, is that is that correct? Yeah, basically. So, B, uh, BNT is the network token for the Bancor network. Sure. And built into BNT, we have some security mechanisms in place, uh, and we fired off some of those security mechanisms as soon as the BNT was stored. And basically, what that did was the the attacker couldn't get away with those BNT. So the only tokens we were able to freeze are BNTs because we, we don't have access to be able to do anything on any any other tokens, and uh, and the only tokens the only person whose tokens we froze we froze were the attackers. So the only people that suffered as this were the people that were trying to steal the money from the network. Um, and and for us, I think it's a really important it's a really important tool that uh, that really preserved the integrity of the network. Right? I mean, ten million dollars worth of BNT. If that actually would have gotten out to the market, it would have caused a massive, uh, a massive dump, and it uh, it would have it would have affected a lot more people. So at this, the, the way we implemented it, uh, I think all of our users are better off. The, uh, the network is better off, and 
community that a lot. And, and I really think it's something that more tokens should consider adding, right? It's the security mechanisms. Sure. Like how, I, at what point do you say, all right, you know what? They, what we're trying to do here is build a decentralized liquidity network. Right? That's, this is Bancor's vision. And we obviously have a lot of stumbling blocks along the way anyways, right? We're building a brand new concept in a brand new industry on, an, on a blockchain that's been around only for four or five years, right? Sure. So, so this, uh, this, with all of these challenges, if, if we still get stuck also by security, by, by security uh, attacks and, uh, you, you know, it'll make it, uh, it, it makes it uh, way more challenging and, and uh, it makes it much more unlikely. And, uh, and we're here to, to provide something that this world really needs, which, uh, is freedom of currency. Sure, is sure. For anybody to create a currency and for that currency to have liquidity, and to have utility. And that's that's Bancor's mission. And I think that's the mission of most people in blockchain is freedom of currency, right? Destroy the monopoly on currency that exists today. So I, I think that's that's our priority and that's where we're headed. And uh, and the way we did that was uh, by making sure that the state didn't get away with $10 million. Sure, sure, sure. So, you know, a lot of people are, you know, talking about this, uh, you know, ideal, like what an ideal uh, model of a decentralized, uh, what this would look like completely decentralized. And some people would say that, you know, the ability to freeze funds, something like that is inherently centralized. Um, so is, in, in, is, does Bancor um, kind of see a trade-off between those two tensions, like maybe not being able to shift from one ideal to another so easily? Uh, maybe what's the, what's your all's take on that? You, you mentioned some of that briefly in, in your well, last explanation, I, but I, I think some of the well, first of all, for those that remember the DAO attack mm -hmm. on Ethereum, right, where somebody, where a, a hacker broke into a smart contract and was able to steal one hundred and fifty million dollars, one hundred fifty seven million dollars, and um, and the Ethereum community decided to roll back the blockchain, right? I mean, that's that's a way more centralized move and, and way more uh, uh, detrimental move. Been freezing funds. They actually had to roll back transactions on the blockchain. And, and uh, I mean, there were people that didn't support that move, right? And those were the Ethereum Classic people. And uh, Ethereum Classic still exists today. There's a hard fork in Ethereum. Those that wanted the attacker to get away with the money and those that didn't. And Ethereum Classic right now is about 2% of the market cap of Ethereum, right? So on the network that Bancor is built on, right? So Bancor built its decentralized network on Ethereum. Ethereum was faced with the exact same situation, and most Ethereum holders concluded that it's ultimately better to preserve the integrity of the network than to have decentralized as the as the question, right? Is this a decentralized move? That wasn't the question. The question is, what's better, right? Like, what is what is the lesser of two evils? And the the, the founding fathers of our blockchain, right, of uh, Ethereum blockchain, uh, uh, went with integrity of the network so, sure so, uh, you know we, we we firmly believe that that's the right that was the right move and we firmly believe that if anyone else is in this position that that's what they can do sure very cool yeah thanks for the explanation that's uh that's that's a you know good point that there are uh you know bankers not the only person that has to make this call and uh there are much bigger problems that can present themselves as we've seen in the past <laughs> yeah yeah, very cool. So, um, you know, what uh, what kind of what have we maybe learned from this situation? Like, what kinds of uh, security measures are you all implementing or trying to, to to do to prevent these types of things in the future? And maybe what can you suggest for you know others who may find themselves in a similar position or are trying to avoid a similar situation themselves? Well, first of all, I understand that you have a lot of uh, DApp developers. Uh, That's right. And, and for, for those people, I think the ones that are creating tokens and creating new networks for themselves, I recommend, especially when you're starting off, to create, to make sure that you have some sort of security mechanism. Right? I mean, we're, most, most developers come from a place where, uh, aside from embedded developers, but come from a place where you develop something, you put it out there, you learn from it, you see how people interact with it, you upgrade it, you move with it. And uh, that's, that's not really the case for smart contracts. On that's right. You kind of deploy them and that's it. You just kind of pray. And uh, as a result, I, I, firstly, I recommend that uh, you take that into account when, when developing your systems to make sure that uh, 
to protect it. Um, what we learned from it also is, you know, from, from a security standpoint, once, uh, once this attacker actually got the funds, moved over to his wallet, he immediately just started like sending them over there. And you could see this like trail, it looks like a, I don't know, it looks like just a bunch of nodes and then and they get split up into more nodes. And, you know, we we're trying to track the funds initially and um, we ended up creating a, a tool to help us track the funds uh, as they were uh, passing them from uh, address to address. And uh, the first and foremost, we're going to open source and release that tool that we developed to, to, for us to try and track this guy. And we want everybody to have this ability. Right? I mean, Bancor is lucky in the sense that we have the development team and the product team to be able to build these technical tools to uh, help us defend ourselves. But for most people, they don't have this. So first of all, we want to make sure that the blockchain industry in general is safe. Uh, another thing we're doing is actually we're creating an alliance with different exchanges and different people in the industry that will work together to create these, uh, I don't want to call them blacklists, I want to call them like flagged lists, right? A list of like flagged accounts that might be suspicious. So that way we can actually start fighting crime, right? I mean, the the, uh, the idea of the Wild West, it was great, you know, it's like the, uh, the, the first open blockchain where we can start developing on, but I think we've gotten to a point where, you know, we're a little bit more mature and we start cleaning up this industry and making it a little bit safer for mass adoption. And until we can clean up the security issues and prevent hacks and all these things, then I think it's uh, we still have a ways to go. Sure, sure. So, um, what you know? How do you you know? How do you pursue recourse on an attacker like this? How do we pursue recourse? Well, um, there uh, there are a few methods. I mean, first of all, we we have been working with authorities. To, uh, to try and track this guy down. Um, additionally, we've been working with other exchanges and other people in the industry that are uh, on board. Uh, there's been a few a few different companies that have been really helpful. Uh, the guys at Chainalysis have been super helpful in this. And um, and uh, you know we're 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 really doing our uh, we're, we're fighting the good fight and working with a lot of people to try and bring you guys uh, bring you guys to justice. Yeah, yeah, very cool. Well, um, that's, yeah, that's awesome. It's, it's really great to hear y'all's perspective on all of this. Um, well, maybe before we wrap up here today, is there anything, uh, like any kind of main takeaway that you'd want, uh, the audience watching to know before we kind of finish up here? Yeah, sure. I mean, there's, there's a few things. So first of all, Bancor is one of the largest gaps on the Ethereum blockchain today. And, uh, and, and that's a, a pretty substantial hit. Right, that one of the largest dApps on the blockchain uh, was able to be attacked like this. So first of all, uh, this speaks to all dApp developers and all people on the blockchain to be extra diligent when they produce security. But I mean, we have some very robust security me mechanisms in place already uh, before this breach, and now we've doubled up on all of them. And uh, and I, I think it's a it's a good reminder to be extra safe out there. And um, and also, uh, you know, I, I would say for DAP developers specifically, if I think the best way to progress in this industry is to not take existing things that exist outside of the blockchain and to try and port them over to the blockchain. The, uh, I think the big wins here are going to be to redefine and reimagine the way we see currency, the way we see money, the way we see economies. We see that with BNT, right? The BNT token itself is something that could not have existed before Ethereum. It's, uh, it's money that holds money. It's a token that built into the smart contract has a reserve of another token. Uh, in in sure. the example, it's Ethereum. So you can actually buy and sell the token through the smart contract. Uh, and, and I think these kinds of advancements in, in currency and money and on the blockchain are the big wins uh, for all of us. And I think that's really what's going to start uh, taking over this, this, uh, this space is things that were not possible before the blockchain. Well, Very cool. Well, uh, again, I really enjoyed our chat today. Um, I really enjoyed kind of hearing Bancor's perspective on this incident, and uh, it was great to give you guys a chance to kind of, uh, you know, tell people uh, straight straight from you all, like what uh, kind of what went down and and uh, the details that you all are, uh, of how you all are, are handling this. So I really enjoyed this. I'm sure that everyone else has. Um, is there any place that uh, we can follow up with Bancor on on continuing updates about this kind of thing? 
go to Bancor.network to actually see the uh, the web app where you can buy and sell tokens. Sure. Or you can go to Twitter or slash Bancor, uh, Telegram group, at Bancor. Sure. Uh, rep slash r slash at Bancor. Uh, <laughs> all, the, uh, all the channels for cool. there. All right. Well, everybody, be sure to check out Bancor. And uh, again, thanks for coming on the channel today. Uh, and until next time, thanks for watching DAP University.